beach. And there was a big playland area, you know, where the carnival-like stuff is going on. And they said, I walked all the way over two, three blocks inside that place to find me. Come here, Bobby! And grab me by the arm and walk me all the way back out there and say, now look out there. Had me looking at the ocean. You know what I mean? You could sit there. She said, you see that? It's flat, 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 by for as I can see. And you run around here talking about the earth is round. Boy, you're going to hell. You're going to damnation. You know, and I'm saying, yeah, I don't want to examine them all my head. I don't want to twist my ear no more and all that. It was a mess. See, I examine ideas did not correspond correctly to reality about the shape of the earth. She just didn't know no better, so to speak. You know what I mean? But still in all, when Dr. Martin Luther King came, I said, I'm going to hear this, brother. 1962. Dr. Martin, it was the Oakland Auditorium. 7,000 people, standing room only. For about 20 minutes he blew, and he got to talking about what we got to do to end the discrimination, to end the institutionalized racism, and the discrimination against black, uh, against, uh, uh, against people of color, and so on. And he talked about these kind of companies that didn't hire and these other kind. Then he got on the bread companies, and I'll never forget it. He says, and we're going to boycott these bread companies too. We're going to boycott Kilpatrick's Bread Company and Langendorf Bread Company right here in the San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area. And we want to boycott Wonder Bread Company. We want to boycott them so consistently and so profoundly. We want to make Wonder Bread wonder where the money went. Why? Why did Dr. King say this? The whole place hit a standing ovation, 7,000 of them. And I'm one young student, one young engineer, applauding, just so happy. And it blew my mind. That's the first African-American leader I heard speak that really inspired me. And from then on, the next thing I know, I'm... I'm out in the streets saying free Nelson Mandela and rallies and placards and stuff because I'm hearing about the Shotsville massacre and then after the next year 1963 Nelson Mandela is being sentenced to life in prison for standing up for his rights and his constitutional rights as a person and a human being there in um, there in South Africa and then Malcolm X and Dave Kennedy was shot, and next thing I know, Malcolm X had resigned from the Nation of Islam and created an organization called the Afro-American Unity, OAAU. Uh, and I was going to wanted to join that, but he was in New York, and I was in the San Francisco from Bay Area in Berkeley, Oakland, California. And I'm moving around. I'm in college there. I'm in an anthropology class. So I met Huey Newton. I met several other guys around there, John Thomas, William Brumfield, quite a few others here and there and around that campus. I'm in an anthropology class, and the instructor, she kept referring to black folks, and when she referred to black folks in anthropological terminology and description, etc., she would say Negroid. And when she made reference to people of European descent, she would say Caucasian. And she made reference to uh, Native Americans or Native, what we call American Indians at that time, or people of Asian descent. She would say, Mongoloid. And I suppose these terms are still used today. But by this time, I read and digested enough to know and understand what perpetuates self-hate or what is not correct social science reference, etc., blah, 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 blah. So I'm there arguing in the classroom that we keep using this term, Negroid. You know, why are we using this term? Blah, 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 you know. Me, I'm steeped in all kinds of information. When I went in to make reference to Dr. Lorenzo Dow Turner's work, well, when I made, it was Marvel J. Herskovich who had made reference to Dr. Lorenzo Dow Turner. Dr. Lorenzo Dow Turner was an African American, PhD in English, who had published a specific linguistic work dealing with surviving Africanisms in black language in the United States. And I'm saying, what? 
And I went up to the University of California. I found out I had to buy me a $35 special card to even check stuff out up there because I wasn't matriculated up there. I was at Merritt College, you know, 20 blocks away. But my point is, I got a hold of that book and found out that there were no T-H-E-R-A-R rolling R sounds in the West African languages. Whoa! There were no T-H-E-R-A-R rolling R sounds in the West African languages. This man had done 12 years of field research. He had went to the western coast of Africa, from Senegal to Angola. You know, and went to some to what interior to meet and talk with various Africans who spoke English and also spoke the African tongues, etc., blah, blah, blah. And then came back to the Caribbeans and other places, you know, and came back to this American. They got to the Gullah Islands, which is part of the United States of America. The Gullah Islands is off the coast of North and South Carolina. And found that there was a rich location of surviving Africans in a black language. You know, and so I says, I say that. I drop my T-H-E-R-A-R rolling R sounds. What Dr. Renzo Dalton was saying that black folks are denied access to formal education. This is what was happening in those days. So I had always struggled through the Air Force and after that with my high-tech language. But on an everyday basis, on an everyday basis, huh, I uh, I uh, uh, Spoke, I dropped my T-H-E-R-A roll, rolling our sounds. And I started remembering how this woman used to hang her head out the window, you know, when we were kids, you know, 11, 12 years old. And I remember she used to call her son, Jimmy Lee. Jimmy Lee! Jimmy Lee! Boy, you hear me? You better get your butt up here in this house. And finally he'd come in, get in this house, shut that door, and clean this mess up off that floor. She said, shut that door, and clean this mess up off that floor. Dropped every T H E R A R rolling our sound going. My mama used to say, Bobby, this talk, this is show us some good barbecue. I said, What you meant to say, Mama? She said, Some good barbecue. It sounded like my name, B O B B Y Q U E. <laughs> you know what I mean? And she wasn't saying barbecue, she was dropping the A R sound. That's the way she was raised. And back in those days, it wasn't that we couldn't speak formal language. We were just denied a lot of access to formal education. Those of us who could get access to the formal education could speak any kind of, this kind of standard language. You know what I mean? The point of the matter is, what was important at this time in the 1960s, I'm in a classroom and I'm making an argument. And I'm the other students and some of the black students in my anthropology class. Bobby Seale, every time we turn around, man, you in this class, man, you talking this Afro black talk, man. We in here trying to get education, man. You, I said, well, no, man. I mean, you got to deal with correct social science reference, man. And then, you know, when it, when it, when it, and um, I, I mean, <laughs> this is funny. Bobby, Bobby, man, we try to understand the word Negroid is derived from the word Negro. And Negro is a Spanish word. And take all the politics and stuff away from around it. It's a Spanish word and it only means black. I said, but brother, what you have to understand, we ain't from Spain, brother. <laughs> Our descendants is from Africa, man. Oh, man, some other sister. Bobby, see, I'm tired of this mess. I ain't got nothing to do with no Africans. I say, sister, you just dropped every T H E R on our sound and what you just had to say to me. Anyway, in the classroom, I finally got Huey Newton to come to the class to help me argue, debate the need for correct social science reference to black folks. And Huey jumped up to the class. I'd like to suggest, for correct social science references, I would like to suggest Africanoid as opposed to the term Negroid. I said, that's it, that's it, whoa. Huey sit down, he was in the back room. I was in the front seat, the instructor says, Mr. Seal, sit down. I sit down, I sit down. So she wrote, writes the term on the board, Africanoid. She underlines the syllable. She says, oh good, this is good anthropological terminology. Okay, now. But I said, but wait a minute, I said, we got to equalize the terminology. She says, what are you talking about, Mr. Seal? I says, you know, Africanoid is cool, but we haven't equalized the terminology. She said, I accept this, Mr. Seal. Are we going to argue about it? I said, no, 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 you don't understand. I said, first it was Negroid, and yeah, I oppose that. And I think Africanoid is a positive way of looking at it. But notice something. 
Every time you make reference to black folks, it would be Africanoid. Every time you make reference to Native American, well, American Indians and Asian people.